numbers, whatever you want to call them, macros, and then I'm going to extend a bit over one type which I consider uh, useful for specific cases, which are depth macros. So, uh, what are macros? Macros are basically a way to do code generation at compile time. Uh, you basically write a function against the reflection API, which uh, checks any information that you want regarding the code uh, during the compilation phase. And then that function performs transformations, anything that you might find useful in the time, I'm going to show some examples later. And the compiler will basically invoke that function during the compilation and uh, apply the transformations that you made that can be uh, do some code around code that you already have, just transforming the code, uh, verifying the code. You can do a lot of stuff. And basically, the concept is quite simple. There is not much about it, but it is quite powerful, as you'll see in the examples. What are the macro flavors in, in this case, in Scala, mainly? So you have depth macros, which are, uh, like I said, mostly something that the compiler executes, so a function, and it is basically hooked to uh, certain decisions that you made. So you can say like, when the compiler finds a function with name A, please execute this code. Or you can find a class, an object, something that you want to transform. And this is the basic uh, macros which are simpler than the rest and don't have a lot of magic. Then you have other types, like type macros, which are already deprecated, but they are a more complex type, which basically hooks into the compiler and are used to generate uh, new types, new data uh, that didn't exist when you wrote the code. So for example, a very common use case is configuration. So you write a configuration file, and it has a description of the values that your application wants in runtime. And if you want to use this configuration in your code in an automatic way, you might do a macro to generate the case classes that represent this configuration. And they can be type checked, they can be, uh, they can have some sanity checks that allow you to do a better configuration instead of just relying and then maybe during runtime having some unexpected uh, behaviors. This is an interesting use case but I'm going to maybe talk a bit more later. It's a bit aggressive and it does some crazy things like creating types. You don't really know what's going to be the output. So this type of macros is kind of deprecated. You have other ways to do it, but maybe not a good way to address these problems. You have other things like just pure code generation. So maybe you can do some like basic code generation where you generate the files even before the compilation and you compile the generated files like you would compile any code. So no magic on the compiler or strange things happening. And if you do this prior to the compilation, you can even inspect them and etc. which it's not easy if you are doing macros. Um, then you also have untyped macros, which are, are even crazier. And maybe sometimes you are doing types, but types are a bit of a burden. So you might want to say to the compiler that you know a bit better than him what he's type checking. You are going a bit crazy, so this is also something that is deprecated, but it's something interesting for people to investigate and to know a bit more how it works. And I have references for all of them if you want to look a bit more in depth into them. And then another type is annotation macros, which basically is um, you use annotations to kind of bring a textual abstraction that is not in the middle of the code. So like the other was a function that is kind of I would not say, not necessarily polluting, but that it's in the middle of your code. And with annotations, you can put like the annotation outside of the body of your function, so it can make the code review a bit better. And it has some advantages. And it's something that we are using, for example, in code symmetrics to instrument tracing and other things, which is basically kind of just a hook for depth macros. Or you can do more things, but for example, you can just say like in this piece of code, when you see an annotation, please apply a def macro, something like that. You have 
other types you can check on the references that I'm giving you, you'll have other crazy things and some interesting like uh, experimental types of markers, but this is the ones I consider more important. So inside markers, you have two types of markers. You have black box markers and white box markers. Black box markers are something, some markers that behave just like normal methods. So the implementation of what's happening inside the macro it's not important for you to understand what is being done. There is no, nothing happening there that might be relevant for you to, to grasp the, the transformation. While with white box macros, usually it can do type generation, it can refine the return type, and basically it can't have a precise signature, so it means that you don't know exactly what's happening there. So obviously, if you think about it, white box macros are a bit too crazy and might have uh, a lot of complications. So in my opinion, for most of the cases, you have alternatives. So I would stay in the realm of black box macros with death macros to make sure that we are not doing anything that we might then have problems debugging or understanding or unexpected behaviors. And there are also some weird caveats that might happen. So, one last thing before we go to death macros, it's macro paradise. So, the name comes from some poem by George Luis Borges, apparently, which in the poem he said, I have always imagined that paradise will be kind of a library. And as in Scala decided that a library called macro paradise would be the thing. <laughs> macro paradise is basically a plugin for the Scala compiler, <laughs> and it is basically an, an add-on for the language, which compiles the macros and allows to have a different place when developing macros and innovation. Uh, and you can try to, to use these new inventions even before new versions of the language or a bigger distribution is done with this. Until Scala 2.12, this was a plugin. On Scala 2.13 and maybe in Dottie, they are refining this a lot and the good parts of it are included in the compiler, which in the code below, which is basically what you have to add to your projects, won't be needed in Scala 213 and up front. And some of these features might be removed, but the def macros are probably safe. Ah, well, actually, one last thing. Before we go into the macros, one other thing that might be relevant, so quasi-quotes. So what we're doing is going to the code and doing some transformations, some inspections, and usually we have an AST, which we are transforming. And what would be the good way to do this? It's a tree, it's not a structure that is like linear or something like that, so it might be com complex to inspect. So what they invented was quasi code, which is basically a representation of the of the code using what, what in Scala is called uh, basically kind of a, a string interpolation. And then inside the, that string with the Q prefix, you can write code and you can pattern match pieces of your AST. So for example, when you are um, searching for something on the AST to then transform, you can write like it was code inside quasi -code, and try to find it inside the tree that you are searching. So you can say, okay, look for an if which has this type of condition, or look for a method which has this name and receives two parameters, something like that. So for example, an example of a quasi quote is I'm writing Q and then a string, and I say, I have a list of type int. If I print this, what it creates inside is the AST for this expression, and it basically some names internally like it says it's a type ply with indent and then a term name list and then it has a list of types which come in here which i only have one so i have a type name int so basically writing something that you understand and that is readable you can pattern match the complex ast that is below okay this is very convenient but it doesn't work in all use cases so in some cases, when you're doing complex macros, you might need to write this by hand, and you really might need to understand what's the AST below in the compiler, because you are actually messing with the compiler, so 
it's always good to understand what you're missing. Cool. So death models. I, I'm also not going a lot in depth in these topics. If you guys have questions, I'm also not an expert, but I'll try to answer them. But I'm trying to go a bit soft so you can grasp what it is and you can also go investigate later a bit more. So finally, death markers. So let's go in an example. Imagine that we have a logger, which is a library that we are using, and it has a log function, which receives a message and let's say print something. It might be something more complex, which reads from a file, configurations, whatever, but let's consider a very simple example. This it's, it's interesting, but if we are considering a very complex application where we really need like a lot of performance, maybe invoking, invoking uh, some code inside of here that performs the decision if logging or not might be slow. So we might want to do something that before we invoke the next section of code that's going to log or not based on the log level, we might want to do a condition so that if the log is disabled or if the log level is smaller, we might want to not even invoke the next method because that will uh, do some more operations that are not needed. So using a very simple macro, what we can do is basically we define an implementation. Like I said, use black box macros as much as you can because they are uh, safer and they don't allow you to do more crazy things than normal. Then you say that you are doing an implementation for a function that receives a parameter which has an expression of type string. And in this case, you are returning either a tree or a, an expression of unit in this case. Uh, maybe the expression of unit would be better here. And what we are doing basically is just that. We want to write code that above the library that we are using, we'll check if the log is enabled or if the level is above something and only then do the log. And this is the macro and this is how you define it. So I define the new method called log, just like the other, under an object, which I put like right here just for the sake of the example. And then you can say that I want the code that performs this to be generated by a macro, which has its implementation here. What this would do is basically when the compiler uh, was compiling this code, it would replace this code with this transformation, okay? This is a very like bare bones, easy double example. I'm gonna show you a couple of better examples. So as a suggestion from Andrea, for example, in this case, we are generating code that does diff. But maybe if we are okay with compiling different applications for different environments, we could even do the decision of the log at compile time. So in this example, I'm considering that I have a variable called log level, which for the sake of simplicity, as an integer, let's consider like debug is zero, uh, info is four, because I wrote four here, and that we have each level has a number going higher, and like error is 10 or something, and that we get this when we are compiling the code. So what we could do is to make a decision if we are writing the expression there or not. So for example, if I, in the macro, I write, if there is a variable with number zero and this variable is less than info level four, I'm gonna log the info or not, okay? And then I'm gonna return this expression and this would generate the code um, like we configured it to compile. And in this case, the operation of logging would not even exist in the code in certain environments where we configured it. This is a very specific example. It is mostly for performance, probably not needed in most cases, but it's for you to understand how the concepts work and how you create these kind of things. I'm going to show you some useful examples now. Rodrigo? Yes? In this case, the, depending on the machine where you're compiling, it would get different code on the machine, not on the configuration, right? On the configuration, because you, on the log, sorry, the configuration I'm saying the environment, like the log level, because I'm going to the of the machine that's compiling, not the machine that's going to run the code. Yes, yes, yes. It's the machine that's compiled. So we are considering that this would be done on the build server or on your local machine or something like that. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Thank you. But this, this, this example is a very, you know, just for... Uh,
But I know that there are some people that do this for like really applications that need to be like sub millisecond performance and stuff like that. But it's not very common, uh, I must say. So one place where I used something that I found useful was in codacy metrics. So in codacy metrics, I think it's this one. Oh, geez. This is huge. So in codacy metrics, I did something which is basically try to add more information when we are doing the, the metrics. So I'm going to show the example on the readme. So that's uh, too huge. Wow. OK, cool. So for example, when we are doing uh, the tracing, we need to build a span, and then we will instrument some code. In this case, I'm invoking thread slip, but this could be a method or something like that. And we would do that with the annotation, like this. OK? So in this case, I'm saying that I'm tracing this function. And I want the metric that is sent to the backend to have the information of where this code was instrumented. So what basically the annotation does is to put this code around your method. But this method, which is implemented here in the library, has no way to do in a performance, in a perform performant way, the discovery of what is the method where it's in, uh, what is the name, the package, etc. We maybe could do this with reflection, but that would be probably a bit too intensive for runtime. And a, a way to do this is in compile time. So how did I do it? Did I do it? It is kind of like we already had before when you often did it. It's just slightly different with a bit more simple in some cases. And the concept is I'm going to put, uh, in this case, an annotation. So, like we saw before, timed or traced doesn't matter. We have two. Uh, where I say, okay, I have timed, it's a static annotation. And this static annotation does a transformation using this implementation. You might notice that it's a white box macro, white box macro, which is not good. But in Scala 2.12, since I'm using the annotations, it has to be a white box macro. But in the future, I think this changed, and static annotations are something on the side, and you don't need to use white box anymore, which is cool. But I'm not using any magic, and I know I'm not returning any type, so we should be kind of safe here. What am I doing? I'm receiving, basically, the context where I am in the macro. Since I'm annotating different functions, I, I don't know, like, like, before I said I was receiving a string, right? Do you remember I had an expression of string, which was the message for the log? Now I don't know, right? Because I, I'm annotating random functions that I want to trace. I don't know what parameters they have. So I'm saying that I might receive something, and it's uh, not random, but a different number of parameters. What I'm going to do? So I'm going to map this, and I'm going to look in the tree for a function. And I'm going to say that, and this is like where the quasi quotes get in, and I say I'm going to get some modifiers like that I don't actually care, but can be like private, public, whatever. Then I have a def. I have uh, a name for the function. Then I can have some types, which are not important for me, but I have to better match them to generate the same uh, the same uh, expression later. Then I say that the function can have parameters. It can have return type. So the basic difference between these two is that the return type can, can be non-explicit in some cases. And this was the best way I found it. And then I have a body. And in the end, what I'm doing is I'm going to grab this body and I'm going to write. So this is a return I'm doing. I write exactly the same thing I have, except that I'm wrapping the body with the timed. And what is the timed? So timed is basically, I'm invoking the global registry. I'm saying I want to create a timer. And here is where I'm adding the information about the context. So it's not very complex, but I can maybe try to put it all in the same window. So the trick here is that since I'm compiling, I know where I am and I have more information. So I'm saying that, OK, where I am, I, I can search for which is my enclosing owner, which is the class where I am. I grab the full name, 
of this class where I am inside, and then I append it to the function name, which means that the timer I'm creating, uh, if for example, this is in a class in package, comcode C, uh, my class, will have this name here, so comcode C dot my class, dot the name of the method that I'm instrumenting. And then I'm going to invoke time and pass the body that was there. And basically the code that was before there, now it's instrumented, and the name and the context where it is is automatically being pushed for, for data log. If we didn't do it this way, we would have to do, we could do it with a macro, without this kind of trick, but you'd have to invoke like reflection, get the class and etc. And all those operations in runtime are usually very slow and not very nice. So they can crash, etc. And at least this way, this is happening in compile time, and when my code runs, this is already uh, done there and no overhead, which is nice. This is one use case where I think this is useful. It's something that you don't need to worry. The code is not pretty, but it's also not very complex, so you can easily understand it if you read it once. So overall, I think it's a good win for uh, improving what we are doing. Cool? So, so can you explain why, so you put the modifiers the down there. Uh, yeah, okay. So these are so optional, right? So, so like the parameters that you put on. So I'm, I'm instrumenting a function here, uh -huh. or transforming a function here, and what I'm saying is that I just want to touch the body, okay? So everything that I tried to grab, I want to put the same as it was before. So for example, if somebody is instrumenting a private method, this will have private. But if it's a public method, probably you don't write anything here. So the modifiers will be empty. So it will put empty here. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it just doesn't work for the return type because there's the follow-up. So yeah. you have to match specific. Exactly, things. just like that, yeah. If this was also something that included, I could only have one, but since I have the column, okay. it's, it's not yeah, possible. When you declare a return, you have to put the follow-up. There might be some tweak somewhere to do this, but I couldn't yeah. find it, and I was like, okay, it's so easy, so I'm not even gonna yeah, struggle with this. Yeah. And it's not hard to understand. Cool. Yeah. So this is one example where we start using soon when people start getting more metrics. But then, what are macros good for? So this is something which is discussable. People have different opinions, people do different usages. But in my opinion, macros are good usually for doing generic code generation, and to create domain-specific languages. Some interesting use case where I found is like something that we use a lot in play JSON to generate, for example, the deserializers and the serializers for a case class. So we have a type which has uh, not random but uh, different fields depending on the class, and we want to generate the way these fields are read from JSON. And we can do this automatically, but we can do this with pure code. So we need help of a macro, and how Play did this was to create the format macro, which inside inspects these classes and generates a serializer at compile time. Which means that when you run your application, the serializers are generated, and this works for all case classes that can be introspective, which is cool, right? Mm -hmm. Nice. So this is like a very interesting use case. You see this in a lot of libraries, and it makes a lot of sense. Other case, domain-specific languages. So when you think about Scala, one thing that is usually not very pretty, it's how you have to manage a, a, synchronism, a synchronicity. And if you're using futures, let's say that we are doing uh, a get or a post request or whatever to an endpoint, we receive a future, which means that we might eventually receive an answer. How we can do to compose this is usually like we have to do a flat map, and then we can uh, use the value, and then we can do something with it, and then we can access the other with the map, and then we can do something, and then we can return the response or something for our service. But as you can see, this is like the typical pyramid issue where your code is starting to get more nested and harder to read and to understand. Some languages solve this in different ways. In some, you usually can do it with for comprehensions, that's an alternative. It doesn't work in all the cases, but it can make the code a bit better. But you have some approaches. I think probably you know it. JavaScript has something which is really native in the language. F Sharp has something like this. 
And basically what we could do is to create a macro, which has two functions, which is a sink and wait. And this weight is not the same weight that you see in Scala, where, where the function stops. This is just like a, let's say, kind of a meta weight, where it says that I want to access the body of this result, but I'm not going to wait right here, because I'm inside an async body. And the idea of these macros is for them to transform this code that I identified that is a sync, and that I want to await, kind of, or to compose these two future results and to, and to transform it in what we had before below the root, okay? So this is something that is possible. It's probably not a trivial implementation, but it's also not something in, from the other world. What you have to do is just to kind of, uh, similar to what the for comprehension does, to transform the code in something more verbose, but that makes this code uh, prettier to read in this way. Cool. There is some examples here of more information about this if you guys are interested, but this is like a very nice use case. You, you have this like in other cases, and like DSLs are also like a quite common use case for this type of, of macros. Cool. So I think this is all I, I had to say today. I have some references here like the documentation, if you found this interesting and you want to know a bit more and maybe learn, learn a bit about it, you can go to the official documentation. It has a lot of examples. It's quite good. You have a nice presentations that I copied a lot from my presentation from Eugene, the creator of macros. And then you have Eugene's website for the macros, which has like a lot of papers and talks and work about this. And you also have a nice presentation from Flatma Puzzle in 2014, where you give a, a workshop. So, any questions? Uh, I, I think I've heard somewhere that in, in Doty or Scala 3, macros aren't really well supported, or there's not a plan to support them. Okay, so it's still not very clear, but like I said, at least in Scala 13, which is going to be at least in par with Doty, yeah. they included macro paradise inside. So you can use macros, yeah. and at least the white box dev macros are, should be safe, yeah. and these simple transformations you can use. Yeah. Annotations are also inside yeah. in an um, experimental flag, so annotations might not be included, yeah. The rest is still like very not clear what's going to happen, but I believe that they will not remove the death markers because they are useful for this kind of scenarios where you want to do simple transformations to make the code a bit better in compile time. Yeah. So they, they are investigating what the community built with markers, what they are useful for, and this talk is based on that, like what they investigated, what they found that the community is based on, and they are trying to see, okay, what's the good solution for this, if this is a good usage or not, can you do this in other way? And they are still dealing with this. Yeah, so, so probably they'll, they'll support support the, the, the usages that the community uses most, like the basic stuff and not the crazy wild stuff. Yeah. Depending on if it's really like something that makes sense and that's not yeah. too, too crazy. Because the thing here is that, especially between white and black box macros, Usually in white box macros, you are sacrificing like a lot of the readability and the understanding and etc. And that's probably not worth it in most cases. So they want to control that and to make the language something that's useful and not just crazy. Yeah. So I guess they'll have that thought in mind. Yes. A lot of, I guess a lot of stuff won't, won't support uh, Scala 3 out of the box. But, but they, they are really moving well on that. Like you have Spark already moved, you have most of the libraries that are important that are in the community build are already built into Scala 13. Like even Cersei, which uses like the white box macros and etc. inside, or, or at least some crazy stuff inside, they are already compiling to Scala 13. Yeah. So, so they, they are yeah. trying to move with the community yeah. to not be something like Python. Yeah, very nice. Because it might create a, a system like in Python where where you will have like Scala with macros which should be locked in, in Scala 2 and then Scala 3 which is Scala without yeah. macros. Yeah. I think they're moving slowly. I'm yeah. not completely sure. I think it's gonna still be at Scala 214. I'm not sure. But they, they are trying to go slowly on the things they remove and they add. But I think it's going 
going nice yeah. but they are forcing a lot like people to evolve to new versions yeah so it's not easy if people stuck in Scala to 11 and stuff like that and that's going to be a bit harder but until now there are not a lot of breaking changes and i think the breaking real breaking changes will come on the yeah. the the first release of that like probably like two three years from now still cool any more questions no nice then thank you Okay. For more information and queries, contact us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you guys. Bye bye. Bye.